आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा This week, we take a look at a somewhat unexciting side of Bangalore's urban development, sewage disposal and how it's becoming a problem for city planners. From Bangalore, we travel to Andhra Pradesh to the Al Kabir slaughterhouse in Medak district to see why it's become so controversial. We also show you how you as a citizen can do your bit in garbage disposal. And finally, we take a look at how the greenhouse effect works. But first, sewage. Each time you bathe, wash your clothes or just your hands, water down the drain becomes sewage. With the spread of urbanization, the quality of water supplies and sewerage facilities generally declines. And nowhere is this more obvious than in India's fastest growing city, Bangalore. Together with lack of sanitation and an uncertain water supply, Bangalore is facing severe waste disposal problems. Manira Alva reports. It's 9.30 on a beautiful December morning in Bangalore. We have decided to follow a trickle of sewage water from the heart of the city and see if it really reaches the intended treatment plant. As you can see, what begins as a trickle has turned into a stream. Follow the stream a little longer and you have a waterfall. And finally, you actually have a lake of contaminated water. But the worst is yet to come. Instead of reaching the treatment plant, the water has gushed right past it into the Akravati River. The Akravati is a tributary of the Kaveri from which Bangalore gets its drinking water. The question is, how safe is it? As always, state government officials paint a rosy picture. What according to you would be an official estimate of Bangalore's groundwater contamination? It is not much. How much is it? I, don't, I can't uh, exactly, but uh, you know groundwater, whatever they are getting, except at uh, some uh, Tannery road or so, it is not polluted. We have got three proposed treatment plants, and of these, only one is working, and that too not satisfactorily. This is despite the fact that Bangalore is India's fastest growing city with an ever increasing population that today exceeds all projections. It is to support spiraling numbers that land and water resources are being put under incessant pressure that cannot be sustained for too long. But of all the consequences of Bangalore's unchecked urbanization, sewage water disposal is proving to be the most difficult and hazardous. Of the 430 million litres of fresh water that enters Bangalore every day, about 80% gets converted into sewage water. It doesn't matter if you washed your fingers or your car or just flushed the toilet. Water down the drain becomes sewage. And once that happens, it constitutes a disposal problem that is becoming unsurmountable. To put it simply, the creation of infrastructure like underground pipes leading to treatment plants has not been able to keep pace with urban development. In fact, much of the sewage system remains exactly as it was in 1930 when it was first constructed. Today, instead of being disposed of carefully, sewage finds its way into rainwater drains. Nowadays, many of the layouts which are being formed, like BDA layouts which are being formed, they don't get any protected sewer system. They have to rely on septic tanks, all the layouts in fact. And even when they are connected, they don't operate the way they should. Living on the Edge found that quite apart from the secondary treatment plant functioning, partially treated water was being allowed to run into a lake where recycled water was being stored. No, it happens only in case of power failures. Generally, it won't happen. If the power failure is more than one hour, we'll bypass otherwise we don't buy. We don't have any captive power. We are proposing that also. But what is even more worrying than non-functioning treatment plants 
is the fact that fresh water supply lines are laid alongside sewage pipes. This means that contamination of drinking water is more than a definite possibility. The standard is that the, the sewage pipe has to be at least a meter below the water pipe, at least a meter below, so that the, the, the uh, coliform or whatever bacteria which are there in the sewage water will travel downwards and thereby it, it will not affect the uh, water line. So, if the pipes are getting eroded, then uh, there is every, every chance that sewage may be uh, infiltrating the water pipes if they are running parallel to each other. What you see behind me is actually a storm water drainage facility in the heart of Bangalore city. But on a non-rainy day like today, one can see hundreds of thousands of gallons of untreated sewage water gaining volume and momentum as it follows a trail of destruction, contaminating surface waters and ground waters along the way. And yet, officials of the Water Supply Board are quick to deny the existence of a problem. Corporation uh, as well as uh, Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board has taken steps uh, to divert uh, the sewage flowing uh, to the also tank. Oh, uh, also tank is not uh, getting any sewage. Independent studies reveal that over 75% of Bangalore's groundwater is already contaminated. Drinking water tests at Maleshwaram, a residential locality, showed pollution levels that were far above World Health Organization standards. The studies done by the Environment Department of a local college also reveal a significant increase in the coliform count in groundwater over a five-year period. The coliform count is a means of establishing the presence of harmful bacteria that can heighten susceptibility to disease. We have tested samples of groundwater in different parts of Bangalore. We have sent it to the Pollution Control Board. They have also tested it in private laboratories, institutional laboratories, and they find that the count of coliform bacteria in the groundwater is rather high. So much so, people are advised not to drink untreated water, even from war wells. In these circumstances, the question arises. Will it ever be possible to evolve a system to effectively transport the city's sewage to treatment plants? The collection and treatment of domestic waste was earlier considered a municipal task, but now various options need to be examined. Perhaps it's necessary to set up dozens, even scores of smaller treatment plants across the city. Living on the Edge discovered a domestic sewage water treatment plant in the Vidya Rana Pura Housing Cooperative and it was set up without any assistance from the government. Of late, the Water Supply Board is thinking of privatizing the operations and management of treatment plants. They also plan to locate power sources close to them. This will ensure that sewage treatment is a continuous process and is not disrupted by power cuts. Its initiatives such as these and the realization that all citizens are responsible for the mess they create that will help regulate and control sewage disposal. Until then, sewage will only continue to contaminate groundwater and even so-called fresh water will be a carrying medium for a host of diseases calling into question the sustainability of Bangalore's unending urban growth. That was Manira Alva on Bangalore's waste disposal problems. From Bangalore, we moved to neighbouring Andhra Pradesh, where over 60,000 people were recently taken into custody when they protested against the continuing functioning of the al kabir slaughterhouse. In the recently concluded assembly elections, the slaughterhouse was an environmental issue that dominated electioneering in Rudra Ram in Medak district. But what is it about the slaughterhouse that has so sharply divided political parties? To what extent is Al Kabir responsible for the dwindling livestock population in the state? And do the benefits of India's first mechanized slaughterhouse really add up? Sunil Manoran set out to get some answers, but found that they were not easy to come by. Oh, Al Kabir, to ban karna chahiye. Oh, Al Kabir se pashu pa jaan hai rahi the. Oh, pashu ka pralan rahi tha. Isliye vyavsay bhi band hota. Oh, rahi thong ko, oh, kisanon ko bhi wacha na rahi tha. अलकाबीर को जो गवर्नमेंट को अपोजिशन में लाके हम आंदोलन करने का है अलकाबीर को बंद करने का ऐसा गवर्नमेंट के ऊपर एक प्रेशर लाने का इरादा है इसमें गरीबों के लिए और रईत के रईतों के लिए तो फार्मर के लिए 
सोचता नहीं मगर एनिमल्स को काटे तो क्यों सोचता है आंध्र प्रदेश के बारी परिश्रम का जो उसका जो काली उसका जो इसका पूरा सपोर्ट अलका बिर को है और लिया जाके यहाँ के पब्लिक का कोई सपोर्ट नहीं है अलका बिर के लिए सिर्फ वो के सिवा और दूसरा किसी का सपोर्ट नहीं है In the recently concluded assembly elections in Andhra Pradesh, there was one constituency where an environment issue dominated the campaign, and this was no surprise, considering the unhappiness of large numbers of people over the continued functioning of India's first mechanized slaughterhouse in Rudraram in Medak district. Set up just two years ago to garner precious foreign exchange, the Al Kabir slaughterhouse has been a bone of contention for many. Thousands of people have been agitating against its very presence, let alone its operation. In fact, on September 26th last year, over 60,000 protesters were arrested for breaking the peace. But what exactly are the issues involved? Is it just a question of ethics, or are there other factors justifying the protests of the residents of Rudraram? The first argument against the abattoir. is that its superlative efficiency will reduce the buffalo population in the country by half over the next 20 years complete annihilation it is said will occur over 36 years the buffalo is known as the tractor of the east irreplaceable for 50% of our farmers the second factor that troubles residents is a drastic fall in milk production in the area rendering operation flood ineffective the cattle in india they don't see as a mass of meat any cattle the it is uh, a, a full life giving uh, unit any cattle whether it is a buffalo or say a bullock or a cow so it is used for the milk it is used for the transport it is used for the uh, energy it is used for the manure so the marginal farmers the poor farmers they hold only half acre to 1 acre of land they cannot afford to purchase a tractor worth about 4 lakhs and till their uh, land if a tractor is beyond the reach of average farmers acquiring a buffalo which should have been easier is also becoming difficult a buffalo now costs about 10000 rupees three times more than it cost a couple of years ago दूध का बीस लीटर लीटर होगा मिल रहा है नहीं तुम्हारा गाँव अगर रुद्रा राम आ गया नहीं पटन चना ये टाइम के दूध मिलता नहीं तुम्हारा फिर क्या हो पचास रुपए लीटर लेके आओ तू गाँव ये पटन चना में जाके लेके आओ बट दे इज मोर टू दल कबीर कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी जस्ट हाई मिल्क प्राइसिस एंड ड्विंडलिंग बफलो पॉपुलेशन दॉटर हाउस ऑल्सो जनरेट ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ वेस्ट विच इज लेट आउट डायरेक्टली इन टू वॉटर बॉडीज सो यू आर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग सम मोर बैक्टीरियल पोल्यूशन ऑल्सो वेर दिस बैक्टीरिया If it is dried up, it goes into the air, causes disease. If it is wet, it grows fastly and uh, causes pollution of the groundwater, surface water, and the fields. Besides, the slaughterhouse consumes over one and a half million tons of water every day from the Hyderabad Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewerage Board. This is despite acute water shortages in nearby areas. When we visited Rudraram to film the slaughterhouse, we were prevented from entering. Phone calls were made to the owners who were abroad, who apparently said we were not to be let inside. One of the supervisors who spoke to us off camera said the abattoir generates 60 crores in foreign exchange every year. He also implied that no government at the state level, whatever its ideology, could afford to ignore that. But to living on the edge it seems a little paradoxical that animal manure is not seen as a viable financial incentive to keep animals alive for instance we have been forced to import animal dung as fertilizer from holland paying in precious foreign exchange dung is something that should be readily available given our cattle population Besides organic substitutes for chemical fertilizers will reduce our 4500 crore rupees import bill every year. After all, chemical inputs are being increasingly seen as responsible for soil degradation over time. As a result, the viability of beef export, especially in the long run, is seriously in doubt unless there is some control over the numbers and types of animals slaughtered.
That report was prompted by Vai Maruti, Sham Joshi and scores of our other viewers in Hyderabad. This only reflects the strong sentiment the slaughterhouse evokes. From sewage to slaughterhouse to garbage. Each year our cities generate millions of tons of garbage. Not only is it difficult to dispose of, but it's also a cause of disease as the recent outbreak of plague suggested. This week, Nandini Rajwade, in response to Rema Venugopal of Kunur and MS Bisht of Almora, UP, asks if it's possible for individuals and families to reduce the burden on the environment. The question is, can we take our civic duties a little more seriously? Every day, each of the capital citizens generates half a kilogram of waste. Multiply that by 10.5 million and you can gauge what civic authorities have to contend with. Garbage generation in other cities too is at comparable levels. Our cities and towns generate waste which is 60% non-biodegradable, which means that it does not degenerate and decompose easily. In rural areas on the other hand, only 10% of the waste is non-biodegradable. This means that villages generate waste which is easier to assimilate. The reality is that citizens in urban areas are hardly ever concerned about civic participation, let alone public welfare. Not only do we let garbage pile up in back lanes, roadsides and colony bins, but we also believe that it is not our responsibility. Sorting out waste does not take time if done methodically. Anyway, it is better than just dumping it over your back wall and expecting scavengers or the municipality to do your dirty work for you. All you need are four different bins or even cracked plastic buckets. You can use one for organic waste that is easily biodegradable, one for plastic, one for paper and one for glass. Toxic waste like pesticide containers and aftershave sprays must be disposed of separately as they become harmful when mixed with other waste. Sorting out your waste will not only allow rack pickers and kabariwalas to do their job more efficiently but also help you realize what sort of waste you generate. This is a vermi compost bin which is a very effective way of controlling your organic garbage yourself at home. Very easy to make, just take a foot deep tray Put a little jute, put some coconut fiber, put some gober, which is essentially manure, and put lots of little earthworms, which are going to eat your garbage up. And then you put your garbage about eight inches deep and cover it with gober. Keep it damp all the time. It's also very important to do it like this, not to throw your garbage outside, because then your garbage putrefies. It causes a lot of infection, a lot of parasites breed in it. Plus, rag pickers with injuries find that this garbage is making their injuries septic. So here you have something very simple and with very far-reaching effects causing a zero garbage situation. In Singapore, heavy fines ensure garbage discipline. In India, few of us think twice before throwing ice cream wrappers in the road, littering parks and soiling pavements. Carrying a bag to collect your waste or using dustbins where available is a better option. If children are taught these habits at a young age, an entire generation can be transformed. Besides, reusing plastic containers instead of just collecting new ones also helps. You can also pay whoever cleans your garbage a little more to be more efficient every day. It is only when we realize that we are responsible for the garbage we create that we would have taken the first step to effective waste disposal. Standing as we are at the threshold of a consumer society, waste disposal can only become more complex. Blaming civic authorities for inaction and inefficiency cannot free us from our responsibility. After all, it is individuals who are the primary generators of waste. The greenhouse effect is set to occur when excessive carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. This is set to lead to the gradual warming of the earth and a host of other climatic changes. Here for SK Singh of Mirzapur UP and P. Victor of Madras, Nandini Rajwari describes how the greenhouse effect works. It is quite simple really. 
When carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere in large quantities, it builds up in a layer that traps the Earth's heat. There are many reasons for the carbon dioxide buildup. The first is the burning of fossil fuels like coal in thermal plants that supply us electricity. The second is the cleaning and burning of forests that otherwise trap carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. And finally, the carbon dioxide buildup is also caused, but to a much smaller degree, by methane gas from animal manure and from rice fields. But how does the carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere lead to the greenhouse effect? A greenhouse allows fruits, flowers and vegetables to be grown under controlled circumstances by allowing light and heat to enter and by preventing it from escaping. A huge carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere has the effect of converting the earth into a greenhouse. Like the panes of a greenhouse, our atmosphere filled with carbon dioxide allows heat from the sun to reach the earth, but prevents heat generated on land and water from escaping into space. What are the consequences of this? The most obvious one is the raising of temperatures on the earth. Scientists predict an increase of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius by the middle of the next century, leading to the melting of ice packs and the wiping out of coastal areas. A second outcome could be an increase in rainfall, also causing ocean levels to rise. Some scientists have already observed this by studying patterns over the last 40 years. Rainfall in the US and the former Soviet Union has increased by 10% whilst dropping by the same amount at the equator. This means that agriculture could be affected in unforeseen ways as rainfall patterns change drastically across the globe. Although research into the greenhouse effect is still sketchy, it is enough to know that the US and Canada, Europe, the former Soviet Union and Japan are the primary offenders, burning large quantities of fossil fuels as they do. India is only a minor contributor to the carbon dioxide buildup, but no country can be isolated from global climatic changes that could have profound consequences. Thank you.